I'm the data science cyclist, and I'm going to figure out the optimal climb for an Everesting attempt. Touted as the most difficult climbing challenge in the world, Everesting is a fiendishly simple concept, but brutally hard. I'm truly unsure whether I can successfully complete an Everesting. Although the definition of an Everesting is clear and it's standardized, it's important to note that not every Everesting is equal. A shallower gradient requires traveling further distances, resulting in cumulatively more rolling resistance, and going faster means there is more aerodynamic resistance to overcome. The steeper the gradient, the less rolling resistance and drag to overcome. But if the gradient is too steep, then it will be physically insurmountable and could demand too much torque and more overall load on joints and muscles, leading to quick fatigue and injury. So there are numerous factors at play. Any Everesting is extremely difficult. So why make it even more difficult by overcoming more challenges than is necessary? So what is the optimal strategy for completing an Everesting? Well, it depends what we mean by optimal. The first principle of optimization is set an objective to optimize. Different objectives will have different optimal strategies. Some examples of different objectives could include complete an Everesting while minimizing the time to completion, minimizing total work required, minimizing total lactate buildup and fatigue, minimizing load on certain muscle groups. The first objective is about performance, whereas the other three are figuring out how to possibly complete the challenge. I aim to optimize my chances of completing an Everesting. This is where one needs to think strategically. What will likely be my limiter to prevent me from completing this challenge? Will it be my form and fitness? My aerobic energy system? My mental toughness? Nutrition? Load on muscles and joints? Or lactate buildup? My fitness is reasonably good. In preparation for a prior challenge, I realized that my breathing limited my power output. And so I underwent an extensive inhalation resistance training program to increase my breath strength, volume, and flow rate. I have confidence in my nutrition planning and my mental determination. Cumulative training stress from arduous endurance rides has led to recurring knee problems. If I'm to fail an Everesting attempt, I think that's the most likely cause. Therefore, to achieve my overall goal of successfully completing an Everesting, I'm aiming to do so whilst minimizing the overall cumulative load on my quadricep, particularly on my right, because this is the most significant major muscle attached to the tendons, which will lead to knee pain. Being a data nerd at heart, I would need to use data from previous rides, collect some new data, and use it in combination with physics in order to derive a mathematically optimal strategy for completing an Everesting. The second principle of optimization is identify the constraints. I define three hard constraints. Firstly, it must be physically possible to pedal a bike up the climb without having to get off to push. According to the Everesting rules, the challenge must be completed without a break for sleep. Although some people have taken 36 hours of riding to complete the challenge, I'm going to set a hard limit of 24 hours of uphill riding to avoid mental exhaustion. There will be additional time for descending and logistic breaks. The climb must be theoretically possible to do based on my physical limits, specifically my extrapolated power curve. My problem is to assess, should I be riding on a shallow or steep gradient with an emphasis on seated or a standing position on the bike and at what intensity should I ride? I start by considering combinations of large ranges of gradients, say 0 to 20%, and riding intensities up to maintaining an average of 300 watts. Not all of these combinations are possible. We know it's not possible to ride at a low intensity of say 50 watts on a very steep gradient of say 20%. This can occur when the force due to gravity acting down the slope is greater than the force we can apply to go up a slope. But there is another soft threshold, and that's when staying upright is difficult. The bike becomes unstable and the cyclist wobbles and topples or, and falls over unless much energy is put into balancing and steering. I wanted to ascertain the threshold speed and power for the bike self-stability on different gradients. After reading two PhD theses on the topic of bike self-stability and spending about three weeks reviewing the published scientific literature, as well as conducting my own stability calculations, I realized that there's actually no simple way to describe what bikes are stable and at what speeds.
Scientific studies on bicycle self-stability have also not been conducted on elevated roads. Therefore, I just look to my own experience. So I'm defining seven kilometers per hour to be the minimum riding speed, below which point I'm having to put too much energy into maintaining balance and to make sure I don't wobble and topple over. In hindsight, it was pretty nerdy of me to conduct eigenvalue stability analysis just to figure out where I would ride my bike. Using this threshold of seven kilometers per hour, I could then rule out some combinations of gradients and intensities. Fundamental physics of cycling shows the relationship between the different resistant forces and gradient, speed, power, and other parameters of the bike, cyclist, and environment. Plugging in the seven kilometers per hour threshold into these equations and other parameters for my mass, typical rolling resistance, and drag coefficient shows the minimum power output required to climb different gradients. Again, using the physics equations, any combination of road gradient and average power output, which is on this curve, will take 12 hours of uphill riding to complete an Everesting, whereas being on this curve will take 24 hours of uphill riding. A shallow gradient will require riding further and take more time to reach the elevation gain. I set 24 hours of uphill riding as the hard upper time limit. The last constraint is around what I'm physically capable of doing. I can generate one horsepower, or 746 watts, for 20 seconds. The maximum power I can sustain drops to 320 watts over 5 minutes and 230 watts for an hour. But an Everesting requires consistent efforts for many hours. Extrapolating my maximum power curve, I think I should be able to hold 150 watts over very long durations. I will set this to the last bound on the ride parameter combinations. If the objective was to complete an Everesting in the minimum time, then based on the physics equations, it will be done on the steepest climb possible riding at maximal intensity. Similarly, if the objective is to minimize overall work on the ride, then the optimal strategy is to ride the steepest gradient at the greatest sustainable intensity. We can see that the steeper the gradient, the less overall work required, because there is less distance traveled and so less rolling resistance to overcome. But once one is on a slope that is manageable, the less intensely one can ride up, the less work it will take because this will also minimize aerodynamic drag. The key is to choose the steepest slope which is manageable. Alternatively, to minimize stress and overall fatigue, the optimal strategy is to ride a moderate climb at low intensity. Even with this strategy, it is expected that fatigue will be extreme and last at least several days. For me to complete an Everesting, I need to minimize the cumulative load through my quadriceps to avoid failing due to knee pain. My hypothesis going into this was that the optimal strategy would probably be riding a moderate climb at low intensity and standing up on the bike as much as possible. But I needed the data to test this hypothesis. I needed to measure my muscle load through electromyography. I went to my local bike shop to set up a data collection experiment in controlled conditions. I was fortunate that Greg Cycle Shop unboxed a new 2019 Wahoo Kicker Trainer for me to use. Specifically, I set up a structured session of 30 second intervals on Zwift at different power levels ranging 75 watts to 225 watts and gradients ranging 0 to 20%. I'm uh, setting up some intervals for um, you gathering data on uh, your Everesting adventure. I used an ERG trainer to ensure that I was working consistently at the desired power output for each interval. I also used a Wahoo Kicker Climb, which moved my bike's front and rear wheels up or down to simulate precise gradients. I wore special shorts with inbuilt electromyography sensors to measure and record at a frequency of 25 times per second the muscle load measured in microvolts independently applied through my glutes, hamstrings, quadriceps on both left and right sides. I rode for 30 seconds at each combination of gradient and power output in a seated position and then repeated every interval in a standing position to assess what impact this has on my muscle load distribution. I repeated this entire experiment three times for greater consistency and statistical power in the data recorded. One of these was on my home trainer where I finally found a use for my former student's PhD thesis. Although my preferred cadence for maximal power output is around 85 to 90 watts, the consensus from the scientific literature is that the minimal energy consumption or minimal overall muscle excitation occurs at lower cadences of around 50 to 60 RPM. So I controlled for this variable by repeating the entire experiment at both high and low cadence levels 
maintaining a cadence of 80 to 100 RPM or 50 to 60 RPM. My data confirmed the scientific literature that yes, less muscle load was required when pedaling at 50 to 60 RPM to produce the same power. This wealth of data provided everything I needed to know. Some of the fascinating aspects of this data included, for the same power output, if I'm riding on steeper gradients, my quadriceps take more of the load. My quadriceps also work more if I'm standing out of the saddle compared to when I'm sitting down. But the opposite was true for my hamstrings. My hamstrings work more when I'm seated in the saddle. My hamstrings have a slight tendency to work more on shallower gradients. My glutes take on more load when I'm out of the saddle. Interestingly, my glutes do more work on flatter gradients and less work on steeper gradients. My left glute is less active than my right, particularly when seated or at greater overall power outputs. I fitted statistical models to the electromyography data to interpolate what the muscle load distributions would be like for any combination of gradient and power level output, whether seated or standing. Using these relationships, in conjunction with the cycling physics equations, I calculated the total microvolt hours of cumulative load placed on each muscle for any combination of road gradient and average power output to complete an Everesting. The result was clear. No matter which muscle group I look at, it is optimal to choose the steepest manageable gradient. This held true for both riding in a seated and standing position, but there was less overall load when seated. So I was wrong in my initial hypothesis. There's one nuance though. If I look closely at the curves for my quads when I am in a standing position, the optimal slope is just less than the maximal manageable climb. If we expand the range of power outputs, the interesting curvature becomes more obvious. The reason for this is that when I am standing and at higher gradients, my right quad is contributing more of the effort. So the data and mathematics showed that the optimal riding environment for me is not to be in a slope quite as extreme if I am standing. But if I am seated, it is not a concern and the optimal would still be on the steepest manageable climb. Therefore, for my objective of completing an Everesting whilst minimizing the load that goes through to my knees, I should ride a climb with a gradient of about 10% and ride at the, the power output that I can sustain over a long duration of about 150 watts. These general findings should be true for anybody, regardless of their ability. If the aim is to complete an Everesting in minimal time or with minimal work performed, then the best strategy is to choose the steepest manageable climb and ride at a sustainable pace. If the aim is to complete an Everesting with minimal overall stress and fatigue, then the best strategy is to choose an intermediate gradient and ride at low intensity. The determining factor is how long one is prepared to ride. There is no good reason to attempt an Everesting on a shallow gradient at any riding intensity. There are more resistant forces to contend with, consuming more work and fatigue, and it takes even longer to complete. Now I'm off to find the road segment for my Everesting attempt.